evening all. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting to have a look at Nottingham 1936 this week. Nottingham 1936 is regarded as one of the greatest tournaments in chess history. It so happened that Alexander Alekhine um, also annotated a lot of the games from Nottingham 1936. And I thought, well, we could look at a few of the uh, key games of certain rounds. Because uh, I think it would be good for the evolution of chess style series, uh, which uh, is one of my favourite playlists on the King's Crusher YouTube channel. So Nottingham 1936, what made it so special? Well, several things. There were there was a lot of uh, great talent playing in this. It was an all play all tournament. Uh, Alekhine, Botvinnik, Capablanca, Erva, Fine, Floor, Rozevsky. Then we had the former world champion Emmanuel Lasker. And we had Bojolojbo, uh, Tartakoa and Vidma, Vidmar. And in the end of the tournament, Capablanca and Botvinnik uh, shared first with 10 out of 14, just half a point ahead of Erva, Fine and Rozevsky. So it was a fantastically strong all play all tournament and what prompted me to really check it out uh, was, was it was basically uh, it started to be quite rare to see Capablanca playing against Alekhine in tournaments um, after their world championship match so I thought this was an interesting tournament where there's a lot of world champions together and it's it was Lasker's our last tournament and kind of uh, the rise of Botvinnik really is symbolized throughout this tournament uh, as a major force in chess so it started he really uh, made an impression in this tournament so let's have a look uh, at round one games uh, this week some key round one games so the first game to check out uh, perhaps of interest in round one Max Herber against Samuel Rozevsky so Max Herber playing white played d4 Samuel Rozevsky was known for not having the greatest openings uh, knowledge and often getting into time trouble later. So let's see uh, what happened in the opening. Knight f6, c4, e6, wanting to go into a Nimzo engine. Knight f3, we have Queen's Indian territory. b6 from Samuel, g3, bishop b7, bishop g2. Now this check, annoying check, bishop d2. And now actually black did take the bishop. Sometimes it's just used for a bishop e7 just to cause disruption. Sometimes this bishop just goes back. But here, Rozevsky uh, took on d2. Okay, so from a positional point of view, maybe black could be potentially suffering on the dark squares later. It's something to watch out for here. Black castles, knight c3, d6. Queen c2. So white with queen c2 is looking to play e4, perhaps. Queen e7, but he doesn't actually play it here. White castles. Now black plays c5. And actually the intention is placed on the d-file in this position. Forget about e4. Uh, this d file might be of interest after rook a d1. Okay, is d6 slightly vulnerable in this position? So Samuel Rozevsky, who by the way was uh, you know one of the greatest child prodigies in chess, um, he had to be concerned here about his d6 pawn. He took on d4, and okay, White's got a, a slight advantage here, it would seem with the initiative the dangerous initiative i mean knight b5 for example is striking at d6 but what about the bishops being exchanged they were exchanged here and now rook c8 so is black banking on this counterplay against the c4 pawn well queen d3 addresses c4 for a moment and still targets d6 potentially with knight b5 knight bd7 now so knight e5 is in the air here potentially attacking c4 now this is addressed with knight f3 
And here it looks as though Black's resourcefully, kind of just in time, uh, resolved the issue with the sex pawn because now he plays knight e5 just in time. Counterattacking at c4. White though takes. Okay, does white have anything here? He's doubled black's pawns, but uh, black hasn't got, it seems, an easy target. We see now queen f3, which ties down the rook. Can't take here, because pointing at this rook. That rook moves, now really fattening the c4 pawn. And this is addressed with b3. Okay, now black does have this kind of pin on c4, well pressure to exert with potentially b5, so a6, as though b5 might come ha handy. Knight e4 is played here. So what is Max over up to in this position? Where is white's advantage now? We see knight takes e4, queen takes e4, and this looks annoying on e5 now. How can black adequately defend e5, in fact, without allowing, say, a rook infiltration on the seventh rank? Black tries to keep active. He plays b5, counterattacking on c4 again. And now e5 is going to be protected after c takes b, rook takes, protecting e5 anyway. So all white has is this two to one pawn majority here. Not much of an advantage, surely to try and win. Uh, has White played too quietly here? Rook c1. Offering now an exchange of rooks. Rook d1. Okay, but Black still has uh, a structure which maybe is not ideal in certain respects. White is also threatening, again, that the rook infiltration could be really annoying to d7 here. We see queen b5, preventing rook d7, rook c1. Trying to use the back row trick, of course. Rook d8, and we get this rook infiltration, which is really quite annoying, rook c7. g6, sorting out the back row issues. Queen f3, directly attacking the f7 pawn now. That's protected. Rook a7. Okay, white has some useful options here to consider. With this rook ag aggressively uh, posted, maybe even queen d3, just to try and win this and steamroll these pawns forward. This two to one pawn majority could be a two to naught any moment now. a5, and we do see queen d3, so white's pretty ruthless. In that you know he doesn't mind the exchanges he's just trying to emphasize his two to one pawn majority here very simple chess indeed uh, the check i think is pretty harmless here if black play check maybe just f3 or even e i think e4 might run into f5 but black chose actually queen c5 attacking the rook the rook moves to a6 now we see queen b4 And the rook stubbornly goes back here, inviting, it seems, an almost a repetition. But white now invites double pawns with queen e3, just to try and get rid of the queens. Black's not interested. Check. Now, interestingly, you might consider f3 would seem a move in this position. Our player in the game, Juve Wall, uh, Max Over was the uh, world champion at the time of this game. This is 1936. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's just establish that as a fact. 1936. Can someone establish that as a fact? Sorry, <laughs> Nottingham. It's the 10th of August, 1936. Could someone just historically check to make make sure that the player with white is the world champion at the time? 
I should have really pointed that out. Thank you for that question. If someone can establish that. So this is 10th of August 1936, the date of this game. Okay, uh, if someone gets back to me on that, that'd be really appreciated. Max plays King H3 here. Yeah. It seems surprising not to play F3 a little bit to me intuitively. Okay, we see. Uh, well, maybe maybe one problem. I'm not. I'm not sure. I see too many problems with F3, except for maybe Queen D4, because that would undouble the pawns. Perhaps. Perhaps this is the idea that uh, now in this position, you know, this this might not be um, ideal in some respects. Okay, but a5 is dropping. It's still white. It seems to have uh, a very good position there with a5 dropping. Okay, but king h3, let's go with this. h5, queen c3, queen d1. King drops back now to g2, offering e2 for a5, and that's taken. So we have this pronounced 2 to nothing. Pawn majority, two connected pass pawns. Okay, um, we have the Knock on stream saying world champion from 1935 to 37. Okay, what particular uh, in 1937? When did his reign exactly end? Max Ober's reign. Does anyone know? Uh, so, check Queen F3, Queen C2, H4. Okay, so rook c8. So how is this converted into a win? Well, still f7 is a problem. Rook a7 protected. That's taken. Okay, check. And now the, the a pawn starts running. Queen b6. Now here is uh, to accelerate the a pawn. B3 is sacrificed. Max plays a5. He doesn't mind about b3. If he controls this diagonal, he's stopping the checks. He just needs this a pawn to run. That's taken a6. Now queen b7 is a bit of a menace. And then a7. Queen a3. a7. e4, as though this is a problem, surely. On f3, we can get perpetual. Queen b8 is played. Check check but now white has king h2 and it's become clear actually there's no perpetual here black plays queen e2 and we see check here and actually black resigns in this position uh, i believe well if the king goes there that's easy we play check protecting f2 and in fact at king h2 we don't queen the pawn we just play queen f4 i believe just protecting and this this is this is uh you know disaster on f7 if black tries to to do this then we can we can check now and it's 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 all over really okay so it's confirmed so max over was still world champion at the time of this game okay that's very much but th so the final move of this game was queen queen f4 queen e no queen e5 check uh, so I believe, yeah, let's just look at this final position. Say king h7, um, queen f4. This this is this is pretty hopeless. Um, it was a very very simply played game uh, in many respects. Um, should does anyone want a quick? summary of this game or should we go on to another game of the round uh, should, we, should we try and look at it just quickly again or go on to another game from round one uh, any preference go on to another game from round one or check this game again quickly
Okay, let's go on to another game. Uh, now, Alakine, who was the annotator, the great annotator for this event, uh, let's have a look at his game in round one. So he was playing Salomon Floor. Uh, so Floor had a quiet positional style. So Alakine played e4. And we do have these flights of fantasy openings by Alakine at the time. So what we see now is black playing the French defense, floor playing the French defense, d4, d5, knight c3. And the French defense winner clearly wasn't evolved at that time that much. I mean, Botvinnik in particular did a lot of work on the French defense winner which is e5 and c5 and then loads of theory. But Alakine played bishop d2. And with this, it's strange that it's, well, it looks like a dangerous kind of gambit idea. Uh, Floor played d takes e4. Clearly he's going after this d pawn. So is Alakine a total patzer? Why has he just left this central d pawn hanging? Interesting conception, isn't it? Actually, let's have a quick assessment intuitively. After knight takes e4, queen takes d4. If I ask the question, do you think white has any compensation here? If I give you 20 seconds to have a look at this, what would you what would you say? If you had the white pieces, do you think you've got any compensation for losing that center pawn? You think black's clearly better or white's got something? What do you reckon? Nope. By the way, just I'm, uh, we've gone through a little bit of time now. I'm hoping my internet's stable. It was a bit unstable earlier. If I get disconnected, I apologize, but uh, hopefully uh, this is going to last for at least half an hour more. White has better developments. Chess says, right, better developments. Gaga 12 over 4. Nope. Anyone on stream wants to give an opinion about this before we carry on? Okay. All right, we'll carry on. Bishop d3. And black, well, there is a threat. There is a concrete threat here, in fact. If this bishop wants to move back now, this would be a disaster straight off the bat, surely, with bishop c3. Look at this. Ouch. Okay, so this is a bit annoying. Bishop takes d2 was played. Queen takes d2. Fret. Bishop b5 check to win the queen. Queen drops back. And now white castles queenside. And now it looks a bit rosier, doesn't it? Doesn't it look as though something's happened that makes this look better for white than what we just saw? If you were to assess this position, do you think now white has definite compensation? If I gave you 20 seconds here, does white have definite compensation for the sacrifice pawn? It looks like a very exciting position for white here. What do you reckon about this? Okay. Well, anyway, White's threatening Bishop B5 check to win the Queen. So the Queen uh, moves here to E7. And then we see Knight F3. Knight f6, rook he1, floor takes on e4, rook takes e4, knight d7, rook g4, aggressive stuff, f5, not minding a temporary kind of 
weakness you can consider if that you can consider e5 a weakness rook f4 knight f6 rook e1 so nasty pin f5 is under pressure in fact it's given back now a pawn's given back bishop d7 we see rook takes f5 for black to castle queen side but hasn't he got a bit of a lemming pawn here this e6 pawn rook a5 so why it's not even material down he's got something out of the opening surely king b8 knight e5 it looks like a nice knight uh, to stop uh, a lot of black's activities it looks a very aggressive knight bishop e8 now g3 is just setting up uh, f4 slowly knight d5 rook e4 is this rook going to swing in for an attack here it's controlling b4 just in case knight b4 was a problem with that pin knight b6 queen e3 getting out of the way black was threatening potentially well potentially uh something maybe like knight c4 if no not not in this position pardon me let's have a look queen e3 so potentially e6 is weak though so like so knight f3 would attack e6 rook d5 rook a3 queen c5 offering the exchange of queens and alexander does take that and reinforces his knight with f4 rook d5 okay and actually it's a bit of a grind from here it's equal on material but quite a lot of maneuvering now knight f3 bishop d7 knight g5 putting pressure on e6 c4 rook f5 rook d4 now c5 winning a pawn for the first time in the game bishop c6 bishop g6 can black really put up resistance here a pawn down now well he's got a hold on d5 at the moment there's a threat now with this last move of knight g6 to fork the rooks okay knight f3 toying with black a bit here now finally g4 b6 black's trying to do something on the queen side it seems g5 knight d7 knight has come off h5 it's these pawns which look to be white's major asset now it's three three pawns over here or two to one there so like in the uh, max over game the pawn majority simple thing pawn majorities can play such a decisive role in in these games actually um black's resistance is broken down now quite significantly with this exchange sack rook takes e6 by alexander the pawns are really rolling he's destroying black's position with this it's a very powerful one it seems the bishop's got a c6 target if nothing else later these pawns have just been herded the bishop can also block the two rooks now h6 with h6 alexander is making use of these two pawns decisively because we see now g takes g6 these pawns are just having fun now with this bishop pointing at g8 rook g8 f5 rook f8 bishop c2 so now if white gets in rook d6 then there's f6 g7 end of game he does play rook d6 and he does play f6 now f7 which does seem to be threatening g7 potentially in fact instead of g7 though maybe even a more accurate move is played by alexander rook d7 
With G7 on the cards, Black's position is, is now really quite hopeless. He resigns here. Okay, so what really happened in this game? Did White really have an aggressive gambit? Let's just revisit some key moments in this game. White's gambit here didn't seem that convincing for a moment. How did actually Black end up losing uh, the second pawn? Okay, there's a, there's an issue with this pawn uh, being a real problem. Black can't avoid material loss here. So we're equal on pawns. But how is h7 actually lost later? Just to recap, what happened there with h7? Because uh, it seemed to be, uh, okay, there was pressure on both sides of the board. And where exactly was h7 a major, major problem? Knight f3, the rooks kind of, unless, unless it wanted to move, but e6 was picked on. That's slightly losing control of g6 here. So we've got this h7 lurking here. And it's here actually that this was actually, in a way, this retreat was attacking e6 and preparing knight g5 on this one. So there's a kind of weakness of the last move because that's threatening all sorts of things. We saw bishop d7, knight g5, threatening e6 and h7, double attack. And it was the winning of that pawn which seemed to uh, later, well, the prelude for the pawn smashing through was winning this pawn. So, you know, if h6, then we, I guess, knight e6 is fine here. So, yeah, uh, Floor um, lost the pawn. But instead of taking, um, well, taking here, uh, there might be actually rook h5, I guess, double attacking. So he didn't take here immediately. That might be the reason, rook h5. What he did was actually try and chase the rook, I guess to try and deprive black of this rook h5 resource. And now after rook d4, again, the pawn's on the skewer now, the pawn's on the skewer, the rook moves. And again, you know, before taking the pawn, uh, there might not be a, a definite problem here in taking this pawn, but this knight was chased first. Possibly, actually, uh, there's an inconvenience factor of c5, because uh, where can the rook move? If here we can maybe play this, carnivorous king. And if rook e4, well, you know, maybe this, this is annoying again. So this c5 as well from white, I think is making the coast clear for winning this pawn. So finally, uh, it's taken not with the knight anyway, but with the bishop, without too much compensation for black. And then we see this pawn majority um, kind of being used. And it was a powerful exchange sack coming up, which put an end to black's uh, resistance here. In this position, how many of us would use this exchange sack? Very powerful, it seems. Rook takes e6. Is this instructive to anyone? Anyone watching? Would you all use this exchange sack? Because an exchange sacrifice is a powerful tool often to further a positional advantage. Sometimes you have to lose a little bit of material technically to emphasize positional factors. And here it's it's the past pawns which have been emphasized. So would you all use the exchange sacrifice? On play chess, actually, the rating spectrum, um, we have uh, chess says 2030. Would you use the exchange sack? We have some people above, uh, sorry, below 2000. Sometimes you have to let go of material just to, just to increase the positional advantage. And this is one of those cases. It, how else would white actually progress if black's got a stubborn blockade on f5 and you know you can't really progress that easily with this this bishop sitting quite prettily on d5 
so it's a it's a great way of knocking out the bishop if you if you um if you play something like bishop takes d5 maybe black you know just gets rid of e6 and now rook b5 later it's problems maybe more problems than needed so okay so um you know rook takes e6 sometimes we have to do that Uh, so it seemed quite quite easy after now this pawn sack again is, is a positional sacrifice just to get these two as connected past pawns not minding black's potential h pawn these pawns are just too quick compared to this pawn it just needs all it needs now is this really the game actually isn't a bishop takes g8 here? Have I have I completely messed up this game? <laughs> Was this really the game with with I don't know if I've got the game wrong now. H6, g6. We have rook g8. What's wrong with bishop takes g8? Oh dear, I hope that the PGN is, uh, I think the PGN might be incorrect, judging from that. I think someone's reconstructed the PGN. <laughs> I, d I doubt they've missed, I doubt they've missed Bishop takes G8, pardon me, yeah. Okay, pawns are crashing through anyway. All right, let's look at another game from round one. Um, the PGNs I've, I've got actually from ChessGames.com. Uh, maybe I should, someone should uh, let ChessGames.com know about that. Uh, okay, so uh, let's go on to another game from round one. So we've seen actually two games in which poor majorities played an interesting role. Now I'm hoping this next game doesn't kind of cause a software error because we've got some Alekine's notes which overload sometimes um, things. I'm hoping I'll be able to relay some of these Alekine notes. So this is C.H. Alexander playing white against Mikhail Bopnik. Uh, and this is this is one of you know the rising stars then from the Soviet Union, the USSR, Mikhail Bopnik. So e4 from ch alexander and we see c5 knight c3 knight c6 closed sicilian and alakine considers this closed sicilian as a harmless variation which offers black many good possibilities of defense these are alakine's words here apparently g6 sorry g6 bishop g2 Let's not skip the move. So I've been reading that. G3 is is the usual follow up for Bishop G2 now. So White doesn't mind Black having the control of D4. Um, the idea is often uh, well, there's there's various ideas, but often a setup like this and playing for F4 happens. So we see this Knight G E2. The Knight is not blocking the F pawn. That's a key thing here. Knight G E7. And this is this is amazing. Um, maybe a lot of players wouldn't be taking too too much scrutiny about the opening moves. And this is maybe quite revealing, believe it or not. How many of us would just routinely castle here? Uh, if you were going to answer honestly, if I gave you twenty seconds here, would you just castle as white in this position? If I gave you twenty seconds to think about it. So your move is white. Would you routinely castle? Interesting, because from the evolution of style perspective, a lot is said that sometimes, you know, Alakine, um 
you know, started using the openings, you know, very aggressive sometimes, winning games straight from the opening sometimes. And maybe, you know, he had this great scrutiny here that even the castling, he's got notes here to give castling here a question mark. He said basically in his notes, Alexander and the kind of this game, too indifferent. White should have made a demonstration on the king's side by h4 and bishop g5. That's what Alakine said. And if h6, then we, we drop the bishop back to f4 and we play something like queen, queen d2. And the idea of that would were to cause black um, some development difficulties. Uh, compared to the actual game, so that's that was Alakine's recommendation. But this this looks very theoretical to just castle here, to be honest. But that's interesting, you know. He's he's questioning even you know this this routine move here. So anyway, black castles, bishop e3, and again he's mentioned this idea of bishop g5 or bishop f4 as being better. Um, White should leave himself the possibility of taking the intruding knight on d4 with his own knight. You see, in this position, after knight d4, uh, we can't very well take now because of this fork. Maybe he's got a point. Queen d2, d5, knight f4 now, and comparatively better. Alakine writes his knight d1, so we could dislodge the knight as rapidly as possible with, say, c3. Okay, so knight f4, we've got this intrusive knight on d4. Okay, it's left there, and Botvinnik just takes on e4 and plays queen c7. So Botvinnik's got a stranglehold on the position here. Rook AD1. And Alcon writes the game is already very difficult to defend here for white. Rook D8. So black's immediately threatening knight F3 check just to win the queen. Queen steps out of the way. B6. So this bishop could cause pain on this diagonal in particular, or go to this diagonal. It actually goes to the A6 to F1 diagonal here. Now King H1, another question mark move by Alakine. This move, and not the next one, was generally suggested as a decisive mistake. White's last chance of salvation consisted of Knight B1 with the idea of C3. That's what Alakine considered the last, last idea. And if G5, then Knight D3. Okay. With, and then f4 with some kind of counterplay. So Alakine is is actually looking at counterplay as well. G generally, he, you know, the concept is not alien. It's Alakine counterplay generation. White's devoid of counterplay here, and King h1 doesn't really help the situation. Uh, it's, this knight really is 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 destroying a lot of White's game, making White's game quite miserable. Black's reinforcing his grip on d4. Knight F E two only shortens the end. This move now. Knight takes E two. We get an exchange of rooks. Knight takes E two. And now, unfortunately, there's a tactical combination for Black. Black just simply plays a forcing sequence. Bishop takes E two. And now the back row is a little bit weak. This back row is a bit annoying. Black plays bishop takes b2 just to crash down with rook d1. So he's won a pawn. Check. Check. Rook d1. Pawn up. Horrible. White plays rook d2. Black just takes. And now it gets the queens off, queen e5, forcing an endgame in which, besides the extra pawn, he will possess a powerful knight against 
what Alekhine calls an anemic bishop. It's an anemic bishop. So queen takes e5, knight takes e5, bishop c3, f6. Doesn't mind the double pawns. We've got a free to two pawn majority here. Again, pawn majorities in all these games, the undertone of, of the game seems to be winning with an underlying pawn majority. Bishop takes e5. One has the impression that white wants to finish the game as rapidly as possible. The pawn ending does not offer, of course, any chance. So here, the king just comes in. Black doesn't mind sacrificing that e5 pawn. Because now look, he's generating his a pawn if this is knocked out. A takes, king takes, he's got this running a pawn. Hopeless. King d2, king a4, and here, white resigned. This this was an impressive round one by Mikhail Botvinnik because you know White didn't get any counterplay. He was wiped out without a chance. If we look at this game again, in fact, let's let's flip the board. Black uh, played seems in a very modern manner against the closed Sicilian, establishing this knight on d4. And white just left it there. And black, actually with d takes e4, was was looking at this diagonal perhaps already when he played d takes e4. Okay, so queen c7. Now this diagonal is really quite powerful to use here. So bishop a6, where was white's play? And this, this is given as one of the, the major mistakes. What, what a, it's, it, I would say this, this is a very, very strongly played game by black. How many of you would agree that black's play did seem with, you know, not giving white a chance? A forcing sequence now, just winning a pawn by force. Player in the game, Black's setup is the Staunton system. Okay, thank you. I'll take your word on that. So he just wins a pawn by force. Bishop takes e2. He's showing he can play the forcing sequences as well. He can calculate well. But he didn't give White any counterplay, really. And White's just drifted into a lost king and pawn ending. Gone. This double attack on b2 and e4 is end of game. The other instructive thing about this ending was white, but black just wants his a pawn. You know, he doesn't mind about uh, white winning a pawn here because there's nothing affected pawn majority wise. So just getting the king to c5 here is okay to support b5. Doesn't matter about this losing this pawn here. Okay, hopeless. Okay, so the, these games are really, they have this simplicity to them uh, so far. Um, I, th I think you'll agree there's an underlying simplicity and elegance to, to these games. Uh, how we saw um, the, the players winning over Alokhine and Botfinik so far in round one. and. I think it is a great tournament to have a look at because of the, the clashes. Uh, let's now, okay, for our last game tonight from round one, let's have a look at uh, Laska playing black. Against Ruben Fine. So this in round one, 10th of August, 1936. So Ruben Fine, another great player up and coming. Another fine player. <laughs> uh, so D4. Uh, so we have some notes by Alexander Alekhine. 
Let's flip the board. Lasker playing black played d5. Now e6. He was getting on a bit, uh, Lasker, though, to be fair. e3. And actually, Alicorn's quite critical here about e3, saying a harmless continuation. Black can enter a variation of the Queen's game, except with a tempo more. More aggressive if white doesn't want to play the usual bishop g5 is even believe it or not bishop f4 these are alakine's notes guess who's playing bishop f4 nowadays i think i've seen magnus colson play bishop f4 so alakine's notes are quite interesting so e3 he sees this as harmless it is shutting down the bishop here black castles bishop d3 D takes bishop takes c4 c5 white castles a6 queen e2 of doubtful value queen e2 more correct was actually according to other kind bishop d3 with the idea of answering b5 with uh, d takes c5 okay so he gives this queen e2 of doubtful value here interestingly now after b5 bishop d3 bishop b7 is played okay and gives this a question mark because really uh, whites can force this symmetrical pawn structure with d takes c5 here but it would have been better according to Alakine to play knight bd7 so at least you know if takes you can take with the knight and that's that's a nice aggressive knight we'd have the symmetrical pawn structure position uh, maybe a slight improvement over the game because in the game bishop b7 and white did play d takes c5 symmetric symmetrical pawn structure e4 knight bd7 uh, and there's a slight problem here the, the idea apparently is if e5 we can answer that with taking the knight and then playing knight d5 so okay white played bishop g5 h6 bishop h4 now here you know black should should be about equal you know progmice the personally d takes c5 isn't that good yeah it looks a bit boring with the symmetrical pawn structure and black i th i think you know you know lasker is getting on a bit I've, I'm, so, I'm sorry to say that but this this move doesn't look like the classical lasker he weakens his queen side with b4 alakine's notes say weakening the position on the queen side without necessity or equivalent b4 just does give this knight a4 you know c5 might be a good square for white so knight a4 bishop e7 and you know look at this this target this rook's tied down to a6 all of a sudden was b4 really necessary and things get even worse now for Lasker. He's he's putting his pieces in awkward places now after knight h5. The knights okay might be threatening to come to f4. We see taking on e7, rook a c1. Now you know just a really odd move here. Instead of this knight f4, you know, grab this bishop at least. Wouldn't that help resolve the pressure on a6? Um, this this next move is really really curious. It leaves it gives White a much bigger advantage. Lasker played knight d f6. This knight on h5 is strandable now with g3. It's a ridiculous thing to have done, not to have played knight f4. This is not good. This is just positionally a disaster. If let's have a look at knight f4 and alkyne's notes, why would he have rejected 
knight f4 in this position. In Alekhine's notes, he indicates that um, maybe he didn't like queen e3, knight takes d3. What is there not to like about that? There's the possibility of rook c7. Okay, so queen e3, knight takes. Ah, rook c7 here. But there is rook a c8. This this may not be a major concern. Rook a c8. Alakhan writes. I think with equality. I think it's this position he's referring to. So for whatever reason, this this knight it was it was stranded unfortunately on h5. Unfortunately, and this didn't give black a fighting game after this. This is at move 19 quite early in the game. Okay, so a5, knight c5, rook f c8. After this, white wins per force. The only slight hope the defense was g6. A forcing continuation now from white. Knight takes b7, queen takes. Knight e5. Okay. Uh, it looks as though knight c4 is a menace uh, in this position, among other things. Rook takes c1. Rook takes c1. Okay, we have the rooks coming off. Now this move, queen c2. Alakhan writes decisive. After this exchange, uh, the black knights would not be able to protect the queen side pawns. So it's these queen side pawns, which these knights have, are irrelevant to protecting. If, if the queens came off and we have knight c6, these pawns are going. So. Laska, he can't afford to exchange off queens here. He plays queen b7. Uh, Alakhan said maybe resistance a little bit more with queen d8, uh, queen c5, etc. But uh, this this is just uh, terrible now. Queen c6, queen a7, forcing continuation now. Again, check. Now knight c6 attacking the queen. I'm making way for e5 check. It's horrible. Okay, g6. It's end of game. It's it's, it's, a, it's a bad game by Alaska in this tournament. You're protecting f7. It's a piece down for not for nothing. After knight e5, he resigned. Okay. But um, okay. I think some of the games were, were very interesting from round one that we've we've had a look at uh, briefly. Um, I hope there was something you got from them. Uh, and if there's interest, we can look at other rounds in, in future weeks from this classic tournament, 1936. I think it is of great historical importance. Um, and it's great actually to have access to Alekhine's notes to the games. So we do see some very great keenness not to play stereotypical opening moves. The fight starts straight away really, as far as Alekhine's concerned. No routineness like castling. Um, so I think we saw poor majority examples. And in this last game of bad peace on h5, and unnecessarily creating weaknesses on the queen side being being punished. Uh, so, okay, I hope so, uh, you got something from them. And um, okay, comments or questions on YouTube. I might upload this to YouTube. Okay, see see you all next week then. Thanks very much.